year now of our History and Theory of New Media lecture series, which is organized by Dale Cosmic from TVPS and BCNM, and myself, uh, David Bates, and Rhetoric Department. And uh, we really, uh, really uh, appreciate the support of the Berkeley Center for New Media, who helps us organize this every year. Uh, we're really pleased to have Benjamin Broughton visit uh, Berkeley this afternoon. He is a member of the Department of Visual Studies and also the director of the Center for Design and Geopolitics at UC San Diego. Uh, Professor Bratton is a theorist who works very much on the edge of art, design, and philosophy, and very much in the spirit of what we try to do at UCNM, bringing people together from these different spheres. Uh, he is also someone who has spent some time outside of academia. He was at one point the director of the Advanced Strategies group at Yahoo. Uh, some of his favorite research topics include computational media's infrastructure and its relationships to political and critical theory. He's published a number of academic essays on these and related topics, but also some more general pieces. You might want to look at Outing AI Beyond the Turing Test, which was on the New York Times Opinionator blog uh, website. I think it's fair to say that we're all very much looking forward to the forthcoming book, which I now understand is almost out. Christmas. Christmas. Okay, perfect timing. Um, the title, which you may already have run across online if you're uh, paying attention, is The Stack on Software and Sovereignty. And this is an analysis of what uh, Professor Broughton calls an accidental megastructure that brings together uh, geopolitical structures as well as computational apparatus. apparatus, apparatus. So this afternoon's talk is going to be on related concerns. The title is on AI and cities, platform design, algorithmic perception, and urban geopolitics. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer Brown to the CNN session. Thank you uh, for coming here today. It's always, uh, it's always interesting to give talks with the supervised by the table of elements here. <laughs> I have some obnoxious gases here. I can make use of later on. Make the point a bit more emphatic, I guess. But I, I, I do think you can, you can tell a lot from someone's uh, materialism in terms of how they actually deal with actual matter. Um, so it's so, so all fine and well. Um, the, uh, the talk today um, that, that, that the prepared that is David uh, discusses pretty interdisciplinary. Uh, my own disciplinary background is pretty um, platypus-like uh, um, in, in this regard. So we'll touch a bit on philosophy, tech, uh, technology, some of the more uh, high risk research we were doing in design theory, architecture, uh, AI, and, and the rest of it. We'll sort of uh, flow in and out of, uh, of these things. And, and so we're going to probably best if I begin with a, uh, a parable. Many of you are familiar, I should think, with the Shanxi Pod City near New Taipei City in Taiwan. This future city was late for its own birth, which was in 1978. Originally planned as a vacation resort for U.S. soldiers, the project was doomed by a series of mysterious car accidents and abandoned in 1980. The future lasted only two years. However, when demolition work began in 2008, it was discovered that not one, but five species of orchid mantis, as yet unknown to science, had overtaken the ruins and multiplied to a population of an estimated 10 million insect inhabitants, above ground, underground, inside the structures, in between them, no one knows how or why. Etymologists observe that the unintended orchid mantis civilization has developed an incredibly complex diffusion of labor, not only within the species, but between different species as well. These include systems for food capture, nest construction, stigmergic communication between individuals and groups that have never been observed anywhere else before. The appearance of the mantis has coincided as well with the proliferation of a new subspecies of orchid flowers, from which, the, which the insects resemble and from which they get their name. Now, orchids don't usually grow in this part of Taiwan, but today they thrive in the unusual labyrinth of cold and darkness provided by the mantis' own architecture. The future city, you see, is not for us. The Anthropocene, the reframing of the Earth in the image of industrial modernity, will be short-lived, a geopolitical instant more than a slow geologic era. 
humans are slowly vanishing, even as our aggregate biomass continues to swell. Our cities are not our home. We are building habitats for other forms of life. Humans are the tools wielded by those other forms. We are the robots for future insects. The extraordinary architecture of Shangji, that is the systems built by the orchid mantis, on top of, in between uh, the UFO pond, has become in the short 30 years a precious future archaeological resource. It's not a failed future, but a successful one, our future. We are already in the present, we who are displaced by the orchid. The, the talk that I want uh, that are prepared today, I usually whenever we do such, I usually try to write something new for each of the talks. And so um, it'll be sort of a mix between three, uh, um, a few different, really three different books. The stack book, which they had mentioned, that was Christmas, Fine Stories in Review. Um, a collection of architectural fictions uh, called Dispute Plan to Prevent Future Luxury Constitution, uh, which was published by the E. Fox and Sternberg around the same time, uh, from which the organizers. Um, and a uh, new material, which is from a book in uh, that, uh, book that I'm writing now on AI and design, um, and specifically uh, on the city uh, in relationship to synthetic and artificial intelligence, and some other things in relationship to the city, which we use as a kind of uh, wrap up to the relationship to the question. So, be best to begin uh, with the stack itself, so the core thesis of this, and then we're going to hang a lot of the some of the arguments. The, the argument essentially is that planetary scale computation um, takes different forms and has different scales. Energy and mineral sourcing and grids, subterranean cloud infrastructure, urban software, public service privatization, massive universal addressing schemes, interfaces drawn by the augmentation of the hand, the eye, or dissolved into objects. Users both over outlined by self quantification and also exploded by the arrival of legions of sensors and algorithms and robots. But instead of seeing these as a hodgepodge of different species of computing, all spinning out on their own at different scales and tempos, we should perhaps see them as forming a coherent and interdependent whole. These technologies align layer by layer, perhaps, into something like a vast, if also incomplete, pervasive, if also irregular, software and hardware stack. That acts accidental infrastructure. And so, for just the purposes of, of clarity, some AI in cities, some preliminary definitions of both of these um, quite broad uh, terms. By cities, we define them this way as, as first as provisional settlements organized around some agricultural provision the initial culinary geoengineering, and second, as a node on the horizon orienting mobile people and things as they come and go and migrate. The first is a city as a kind of singular megastructure, and the second is the city as a cluster of wayfinding interfaces. The city is home to millions of species, from microbes to insects to vegetation to sapient mammals. It's a living bacteriological and immunological tumult. The situated ecology of predation and symbiosis across multiple scales, and into this we now insert evolutionary robotics. The cities defined in this way, with perspectives mixed from both public health planning and supply chain logistics, uh, are infrastructure for living and non-living matter to consume itself and for some forms of matter to achieve and hone sentient intelligence, which in turn remake cities in its image. Uh, a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, about a month ago, I was at a conference at Yale Architecture School, a city for seven billion people, um, which I thought was really way too small. Um, Intel has this, uh, no, it's Cisco, I'm sorry, it's a white paper that we've been years ago, maybe. Um, at 50 billion things to be online by uh, the, year, the year 2020, which also seems to me uh, incredibly under, uh, incredibly low uh, number as well. 
uh, to think of this, I think, in terms of just as a sort of reference point in terms of the address space of IPv6, for example, the 120 bit address string and uh, you know, theoretical address space of something in the order of 10 to the 23 addresses per person, uh, all of the address number of addresses. That's the question of what you do with this, this number of this granularity of addressability, which really, in a way, I suppose, has a sort of um, allegorical figure, the city of 10 to 23, um, that is in a way more, uh, more interesting to me. This is a project we did a couple years ago, trying to write the smallest IP address we could to figure out this granularity. This electron lithography being um, it's about 10 micrometers across, about the size of a red blood cell, to get some sense of what the scale would be. The scale would be like that. So this question of the addressability of this, we'll come back to it later. And the AIs. AI is a definitional question, um, which I don't offer as a way to sort of adjudicate um, the, the multiple terms uh, you make, uh, uh, make uses for. Suffice so to say, we'll discuss intelligence as one way that matter organizes itself into durable complexity. A special form of that complexity is the city, a settled accumulation of material intelligence, both human and inhuman. So as artificial intelligence becomes more sophisticated, what will its urban design project be? What should it be? AI wants little objects, little bits here and there, um, each with its own form of, 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 of invested embodiment. And as so, in a way, distinctions between robotics at one level, programmable matter at another, culinary materialism at another, tangible media, begin to blur. And then it's, I mean AI as something that we both already see around us all the time, and in terms of forms of synthetic reason that we are in the process of designing and designating, which will contribute to the formulation of cities to come. We see it in what philosophy calls the other mind problem. How do you communicate with an intelligence with which you only share very partial worlds, which would include Alien in Solaris or 2001, but also, of course, animals, other animals. We try to see AI then not in terms of how, how we think that we think as a sort of virtual or artificial human cognition, but as thinking and embodying another spot than we do on a larger and shared continuum of material intelligence. Now, to situate these, bringing these together to a common frame, the stack these just proposes a, a specific model for the design and redesign of the political geography tuned to this era of planetary scale computation. It works from inside out, the technology to governance systems, focuses specifically on questions of sovereignty, something that's both exploded and then signed in different ways. And as we'll just be in a moment, we said stacks are a kind of platform, but platforms, not all platforms, are stacks. The stack thesis would see then the city as a layer in that larger accidental megastructure situated between the earth and the cloud layers above and the address interface and user layers above. And much more on the users and the user layers in a moment. Now, as for design, some designers, the public architects, may see software as something that is added onto space. They see the idea of smart cities as stupid because it assumes the cities are not already intelligent, which of course they are, and these designers are right. Some designers, called programmers, other designers, may see cities as modules of hardware that fit together, one at a time, into a megastructural matrix. From this perspective, where cities are a kind of computational hardware um, that fits together into this megastructure, and for this computation, is an elemental substance uh, uh, that helps define the physics of every urban object. Google may be, in a way, the exemplary of the second form of urban designer here, figured out that the way to get rid of parking spaces, parking lots, um, not through zoning, but by augmenting cars with cameras and sensors. They too are right, and so one mode of design is nested inside of the other. That is, to use two terms that I actually rather quite dislike, the smart city is inside the Internet of Things, just as the Internet of Things is inside the smart city. 
and so there's some obvious um, design implications in this, um, the rise of network platforms, the physical world, the world services geared towards consumption and marketing, pedestrian optimization, policing, and so forth. But it's not the um, Truman Show meets Alphaville, Alpha Soissons smart control production variations that interest me. Rather, um, there I think are more important design implications. It's not about the automation of what is dull about the status quo. Uh, the interfaces of the city automate inside and out right, the enemy sovereign decisions. Um, it it, it, it put positions the city as a platform and as the city as a, as, a, as a layer within larger platforms. It repositions the user as, a, as an open sovereign position that is not exclusive to, exclusive to humans, which are uh, deep implications for um, for our geopolitics, um, some of which will be predicated, as I'll discuss in a moment, on what I take to be rather productive Copernican traumas. So, to jump right in, we want to ask after intelligence, computation of matter, how computation is a kind of solvent, a particular sort of algorithmic reason in matter. We take it that computation was discovered more than it was invented that algorithmic generative processes are intrinsic to the wider unfolding of the world, and that today's computing appliances are nowhere near as sophisticated as, as days that precede Homo sapiens. We think that the computation is one of the ways that matter, in whatever form, achieves intelligence via procedural abstraction. Sapient brain tissue is matter that has also achieved intelligence in ways that both clearly are and clearly not computational in the conventional sense. And so we take it that the solution, the solution of synthetic computation into our software, <coughs> into the urban fabric, provides a landscape of inorganic forms, a sort of distributed intelligence, because it provides them a capacity for abstraction. That is, intelligence as abstraction, computation as a form of intelligence, computation as abstraction. Now, this perspective should account for two related but different understandings. One would recognize that intelligence and knowledge is always distributed among multiple, multiple positions and forms of life, both similar and dissimilar to one another. And no single neuroanatomical disposition has a privileged monopoly on how to think intelligently. What might qualify as a general intelligence is not duty bound to species or final or its capacity for abstraction. Greg Rossier suggests that the ability of any organism, however primitive, to map its own surroundings, particularly in relation to basic terms of friendly food and foe, is a primordial abstraction from which we do not graduate so much as learn to develop into something like reason and its local human variations. In this way, the mapping of abstraction is not an early stage that we can pass on the way to some more, more complex forms of intelligence. It's rather a general principle of that complexification. Like protozoa and their ganglia feeling about to figure out what's out there, or like humans looking and tasting and imagining patterns. Today's forms of AI sometimes are augmented by various technologies of machine cognition, machine sensation, and machine vision that allow them to see, to sense the world out there, and to abstract the forms of a mechanically embodied intelligence, both deliberately programmed for them and emerging unexpectedly. And so, from my discussion of AI in the city, um, in particular in relation to this, uh, this particular redistribution of the sensible, um, we know a sort of shift in the, in the emphasis and discussion of AI from, a, or, uh, from Descartes from Cartesian perspective, or more, perhaps closer to Merleau Ponty. I wanted to then talk about this in terms of these three forms of uh, embodiment thinking, uh, skin, and vision. So first, in thinking, we, we want to challenge the, the conventional Turing test humanistic models of thought um, that would define uh, AI in this way, epistemological or practical dangers. Um, what today we gather under the name of AI will, hopefully, the argument goes will shift what counts as thinking, but also what counts as architecture and design and politics and program. 
on skin, we'll discuss a bit on the synthetic skin and ways in which we, we see a, a deliberately designed convergence of natural sensation and machine sensing with animal skins like ours, but also the urban skins and surfaces and interfaces and its implications with dwelling more generally. And then lastly, the machine vision, particularly camouflage, what I call the inverse uncanny valley, um, and AI, artificial intelligent paranoia and In terms of seeing AI in predominantly human terms, we can take the article that the Turing test. Now, Turing proposes, in the 1950 paper, um, as a variation of a popular parlor game in which two hidden contestants, a woman, player A, and a man, player B, try to convince a third that he or she is a woman by their written responses to leading questions. To win, one of the players must convincingly be who they really are whereas the other must try to pass another gender. Mm -hmm. So, in, in the original text, uh, Turing suggests that the computer replaces, would, what if the computer would replace player A? And in the sense, the computer is not just being asked to, to pretend to be human, but specifically to pretend to be a woman. And as we know, the mathematician himself also had to pass. In his case, as a straight man in a society that criminalized homosexuality. Upon discovery that he was not what he appeared to be, he was forced to undergo horrific medical treatments known as chemical castration. Ultimately, the physical and emotional pain was too great, and he committed suicide. The episode, of course, was a grotesque tribute to a man whose recent contribution to defeating Hitler's military was still a state secret. Turing was only recently giving posthumous pardon <coughs> tens of thousands of other British men sentenced under similar loss of none. So one notes the sour, ironic correspondence between asking an AI to pass the test in order to qualify as intelligent, to pass as human intelligence, the Turing's own need to hide his homosexuality to pass as a straight man. The demands of both gloves are unnecessary and profoundly unfair. And it's for all passing, the performance's success or failure reveals more about the audience than the performance. Should complex general artificial intelligence arrive, it will not be human like unless we insist that it pretend to be so, because one assumes the idea that intelligence could be both real and inhuman at the same time is morally or psychologically intolerable. But instead of nurturing this bigotry, we should do better, we would do better to allow ourselves that in this, in, in this world, thinking is much more diverse and even alien than our own particular case. Again, the real philosophical lessons of AI will have less to do with humans teaching machines how to think than with machines teaching humans a truer range of what thinking might be. It's better, that is, to examine how identification works from our side of the conversation. It's clearly much easier to make a robot um, than a human believes to have emotions and for which, in turn, a human has emotions, positive and negative, than it is to make a robot that actually has emotions. A human may feel love or hate or comfort from the AI, but he or she is reading cues, not detecting feeling. What seems like empathy is really a one-way projection mistaken for recognition, like the Turing test itself, and not based on any mutual solidarity. In other fictions, Policing the imitation game is a matter of life and death. The plot of Ridley Scott's from Blade Runner, based on both the books doing the regime of Electric Sheep in 1968, hinges on the voight kampf empathy test, which differentiates humans from replicants. Replicants are throttled in two important ways. They expire after just a few years, and they have ostensibly a very diminished capacity for empathy. Deckard, the Harrison Ford character, must retire a group of rogue replicants, but first he must find them. And in this world, Turing test thresholds are weaponized, lest replicants pass as humans and trespass beyond their station. By the film's conclusion, Decker, who himself may or may not be a replicant, develops empathy for the replicants' desire for, quote, more life. And arguably, they too, at least Roy Batty, the director Howard character, seems to have empathy for Deckard's 
own dilemma, his dilemma and ours, is that in order to enforce the gap between the human and the AI, defined by empathy or lack thereof, Deckard must suppress the empathy that supposedly makes him uniquely human by forcing him to quash his own identification with the replicants that supposedly cannot have empathy in return, the principle of differentiation requires its own violation in order to maintain it. Now, in, in addition to the uh, demystification and expansion of thinking that this suggests and the relocation of human sapience in, in some expanded field, the sense of the medium of synthetic intelligence um, may also, in its own way, undermine um, otherwise durable Kantian uh, distinctions between thinking and sensing. And I, in, in consideration of this, I want to then uh, hone in uh, on ways that, 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 that cartographic abstraction that I discussed can be uh, instantiated through um, dermal medium skins. How it occupies and agitates skins, human skins, building skins, and the skin, and how it does so for purposes of mapping. So, some of the research that we're doing, um, PhD students now, uh, UC San Diego Center for Design Geopolitics, in collaboration with the Department of Nanoengineering and Bioengineering. Um, this research is on exploring some of the presumed um, differences between, as I said, natural sensation on the one hand, machine sensing on the other, and how these might be alighted uh, or, and are being alighted by technologies that operate in and on the skin and at the scale of our dermal and epidermal somatosensory system, mechanoreceptors, the dermoreceptors, and so forth. And by this, I don't mean some um, triple O word game for which machines are between kind of panpsychic intuition and affect. I, I refer rather to real deal technologies by which biological and non-biological physiochemical reactions are interwoven at the level of the sensate skin. Now, some of you I'm sure are, are, are quite aware, artificial skins are among the most interesting uh, areas of the design. DARPA has long funded research into advanced prosthetics, and currently one research track Focus on, focuses on providing synthetic tactile sensation in the fingertips and other dermal surfaces of corporeal extensions for the wear, quote unquote, fingers. As said, um, and then in other labs, we find different varieties of epidermal microelectronics that augment the living skin's capacities for sensing external and internal stimuli. Next door, nanoscale chemistry cooks up inks that react to the presence of ambient trace elements at whatever particles they're tuned to react with. And designing chemical sensitivity at or near the atomic level, or the molecular level, and the registration of these as transmissible information with the dermal and epidermal microelectronics at larger scales, we conceive a kind of mediatization sensate surface. There's lots of researchers around the world who, who represented in this. John Rogers at the University of Illinois, in particular, Joseph Wang and Todd Coleman, and this is the and many of your colleagues are working very perfect. Um, together, these, these technologies suggest a, a, perhaps a skin-based microstack comprised of biological, chemical, and mechanical sensing and processing in various combinations. And as a emergent formulation of wearable computing, here including also biochemical reactions, it, blend, it would blend, as I say, animal sensation and machine sensing into composite superficial medium. As platforms for haptic interfaces, touch and motion interfaces, and in terms of interaction, uh, interaction may be a bulk above or below normal perceptual scales. It may involve autonomic nervous reactions as much if not more than the relatively blunt gestures of hands and thumbs. And so extending what is skin-based media and dermal media can be, keeping with the skin of, of human bodies for a moment, we recognize that while photography and cinema made it possible to compose and to see sorts of images that had never been seen before, montage, slow motion, double exposure, 
and similar goes for synthetic skin recorded sound or auditory senses. A larger sensory organ is, of course, the skin. Okay, now, however, quite obviously, to date, we have not developed nearly as diverse or sophisticated forms of artificial touch, tactility, healing, the skin based media as we have for vision and hearing. Clothing, one way that design has leapfrogged genetic evolution to augment skin. It's faster, much faster than evolving fur or blubber is to design uh, scuba suits. But today's dermal and epidermal media make it possible to sense things about the external world otherwise that our skin that our skin is otherwise not able to register. Particulate matter in the air, sense it at parts per trillion level, things about our internal state, think of the chemical structure like in our sweat, uric acid in your blood. The longer term and more interesting design horizons then, however, are skin-based media that allow bodies to novel and unnatural forms of touch sensation that we have perhaps not experienced before. Pleasure and pain are on the menu, but much more besides. And again, if early in experimental cinema innovations of artificial vision and sights and sounds are one precedent, molecular gastronomy rebuilding of food from first chemical principles is another. And if we include taste as a particularly nuanced form of touch, which of course it is, and so. But our today novel tastes are models for other new sensations to come. And the same holds true, I think, for the redesign of the surfaces of the city. Urban interfaces are sensory mechanisms. Sometimes they're binary gateways that allow or prohibit admission into the domain. And other times uh, they are reactive skins that sense threshold events by reacting to light, sound, touch, ambient trace elements, and so on. And so as we meander the city, these interfaces are also our habitat, and we dwell within them. But they are dwelling as well. They sense us as their world, and we are their habitat as much as they are ours. We are organisms living inside of them, just as they are inside of us. Ubiquitous computing acts and in the city skins and surfaces and interfaces is perhaps urbanism as nested parasitism, or nested parasitism as urbanism. Now, from touching to seeing. By shifting this line of inquiry up to the urban scale. What we take to be the artificially mediated surface includes things that are analogous to skin, but are, uh, but also, and also what we colloquially refer to as machine vision. Um, but these are allegories, as you can see. Now, vision has evolved independently many times. Uh, in the history of evolution, and arguably in the past two decades, it has evolved again. This time, not for cuttlefish or rattlesnakes, but for network CCD sensors and algorithmic armatures processing what is sensed into differentiated and motivated recognition. Visual, quote unquote, sensors responding to light, often but not always shaped like cameras, are one kind of design service capable of synthetic sensation and computational interpretation. But in the wider urban landscape, they co-mingle with networks of other superficial sensors responding to motion, pressure, heat, ambient air qualities, and so on. So again, to the extent that it is epistemologically and functionally convenient, we call these various the machine vision or machine hearing and machine scan. But any correspondence um, to the mammalian sensory system is merely allegorical. The AI city may be embodying itself, but not as, not as mammals. As for the media technologies that link the two, when information is scarce, then copying something is the work of the mechanical image. However, when information is abundant, especially when overabundant, then seeing the original, picking its pattern out of the background, this is the work of the machine vision. For thinking <coughs> animals, seeing and making things is easy, but making copies of what is seen and made is hard. For machines, on the other hand, making copies is a way of seeing, and it's much easier than thinking, or perhaps is a way of thinking. 
And so in that varied history of the multiple independent evolutionary careers of vision, which various photoreceptor cells found across the phyla evolved from many different kinds of chemoreceptors, and most likely well in advance of any brain-like information, oh, information workers. We see this in work. Elsewhere, photosynthesis, we could say, is a, is a, is a, is a another kind of chemical response to light. And so in the broadest sense, it too could be considered as a kind of vision without images. But now the, the animalian, the vision image making nexus is obviously primarily human. And it's likely that since the beginning to the end of the Holocene, that the total quantity of images that humans have produced from cave walls to FaceTime measured per year, total pounds of images, total gigabytes of information, whatever, continues to increase exponentially. With digital imaging machines now in every person's pocket, the raw sum of images produced since the year 2005, which claim maybe more than all produced before that year. Depends, of course, on how you define and quantify an image. But what Walt Benjamin called mechanical reproducibility has certainly allowed images to proliferate far beyond the limits of human craft. Today, however, many images are made for no one. But this does not mean that they're functionless. They are made by and for machines that, quote, see the world differently than we do. Those machines don't have eyeballs, or rods, and cones, visual cortex. Right? They do have sensors that detect light and motion and form and heat and color and other ways. Today, the industrial scale processing of data that has been gleaned by scanning the light spectrum in some way, from urban scale street surveillance to millimeter scale quality control along assembly lines, represents a significant fraction of all the work that the world does to image itself for the purposes of government and human society. At the end of the day, the machine finally takes more selfies than selves do. The function of representation in this, however, is perhaps rather different. The image, quote unquote, may remain data and never render to look like a picture because there's no need. An algorithm program to discern a particular pattern or anomaly can see it directly in the data itself. It does not necessarily need for the data to be projected as if for a mammal and then reseen and reinterpreted back into code. Like algorithmic scanning and sorting in any other large data set, the fact that the original source was or is visual is not so critical. And so, like plants, these kinds of machines also possess a kind of vision without images. Or at least a kind of image that would suggest a very different kind of natural abstraction and a very different kind of corporeal experience. An abstraction that is based in chemical informational pattern finding as a, card or as a cartographic simulation of experience, or as that experience, and yet one quite different. Perhaps surprising to some, and perhaps not to others, the function of machinic images today, and of those abstractions, both animal and public, is, as I, as I said, to determine the veracity and originality, often, of what these images represent. For example, some of the shapes printed onto the dollar bill are there for humans to differentiate the value of one token from another. But far more are for machine vision counterfeit detection to verify that this is a real dollar. The piece of paper is full of machines that happen to look like pictures. These are images as machines. Or a surveillance scan of a city may pick out one face from thousands of motions looking for the one true target. Elsewhere, we insert tiny camera probes into great, great paintings to verify that they are originals. It's often required by insurance companies backing large purchases. Capture software shows us an image, and then by a quick conversion of the Turing test, analyzes how the user interprets it to determine if they are, in fact, a real person. And so we conclude that Walter Benjamin's assurances that mechanical reproduction would undermine the word the original is true when, for example, we compare a painting with a postcard of a painting, 
but machine vision and images as machines are also are perhaps more put to work to ensure erratic originals, verified non-fakes, true identities, unbroken versions, normal targets, and certified real users. A full revolution of sorts is made back in the As the image is more fully technologized, as it becomes itself a machine, then you need historical art from the pre-mechanical original to mechanical copies, incomplete perhaps without another curve, but leading now to a kind of what machining authentic. And still, if cities are always about vision to some degree, again, that we think of this in terms we should think of this only in terms of how we we in terms of how we see it, but also in terms of how it sees on its own terms. The, machinic visual subject in that looks is not something that possesses human life or human level perceptual and aesthetic capacity, but rather something that is interesting because it does not possess those things and yet can see us and recognize us and know us regardless. And that's weird and interesting enough. There's, there's the question of how the world looks as a screen. And another more important I think how we look as objects of perception from the position of the machines with which we co occupy the world. Seeing ourselves through the eyes of this machine of other who does not and cannot have an affective sense of aesthetics is also a kind of disenchantment. We are just stuff in the world for a distributed machine cognition to look at and make sense of. Our own sapience is a real and unique. But as we, as we are things to observe that just happen to be sapient, it doesn't really matter to machine vision. This disenchantment is more than just, is, I think is more than just like hearing the recorded sound of your own voice on tape, that's not me. It's potentially the clearing away of a closely guarded illusion. The uncomfortable recognition of the machine's mirror is a kind of inverse uncanny valley. Instead of being creeped out by how slightly inhuman the creature in the image looks, we are creeped out by how unhuman we ourselves look through the creature's eyes. Now, platform geopolitics of all of, all of this are obviously rather fraught. In writing a book about um, AI, as I'm doing now, I found that, that it is uh, impossible, perhaps, perhaps productively so, to fully separate the technology itself from the sometimes bizarre ideas that we have for it and about it. I'm fascinated by how technologies are not only anthropomorphized, but how some are considered menacing and others amazing and some of them both at once. Whether the aliens are reading your thoughts through radio waves or dental implants, or Google is reading your thoughts through email, the borderlands between schizophrenia and sensible vigilance, delusion and deduction are disputed territory. Perhaps in a way it comes down to a level of discomfort, not just with how people see technologies, but with how some people think technologies see them. The occult artifacts of planetary scale computation are a cracked mirror, and the reflection that we see in them are given to a Manichaean, dualistic, and sometimes bipolar political psychiatric imaginary. For example, Google's deep dream familiar with you know, some Google's research blog over the summer it was a project where they took a bunch of images and uh, a, a, a facial recognition algorithm which went through some sort of fine edges filter and then tried to find dogs in the images and then back to find edges things became a little bit more what they were find the dog find the image find the dog back and forth over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again until it saw the dog um, they're quite amazing with images. Like, so genuine, there's something genuinely, uh, to me at least, sort of new about them as an image that painting hasn't accomplished for quite some time. Food, you can write about anything through them. There's a bunch of websites you can upload your vacation pics into this as well. Food turned out really horrible. Porn um, will give you a nightmare. <laughs> never want to just Now, 
the, these images, I think, are remarkable enough on their own, irrespective of their provenance. But once the viewer makes certain sort of partial, empathetic transference into this other mind that the feature recognition algorithm and its way of seeing, the effect is then of trying on a kind of mode of perception and making sense of the world through those eyes. And I think that's really the real payoff. It's also a kind of apophenia. Apophenia is the, is the psychological effect of finding patterns when they exist, or a, a, a kind of causal association between two events or forms of, of sensory information in which none exists. Uh, Paradelia is a particular kind of apophenia of seeing faces and things. Um, the old iTunes visualizer with the funny shapes that supposedly went with the music somehow. It's all in mind. Those the buttons and elevators that you think open and close the doors. <laughs> Placebo interface. These are all forms of apophenia. Conspiracy theories and apophenia as political science. Um, but this is part of what we do. This, this pattern recognition is part of our evolution. Uh, both in its positive and negative senses. Um, you know, to tell you know, the story illustrates it. But nicely. There's a character in uh, Peter Watts new novel, Echo Praxis, who argues that uh, pattern recognition, this kind of pattern recognition, is hardwired into our homo sapiens evolution of success um, for both better and worse, both the positive and negative pattern, but false and true pattern recognition. He tells a story that goes something like this, several thousand years ago, two guys are hiding in the grass, um, quietly looking around for both predator and prey. One of them sees a faint but distinct anomaly in the way that the light breaks through the glass, through the grass, from left to right. And he recognizes that pattern as a looming tiger and runs away back to the village, leaving his friend to be eaten. Uh, the guy who possessed those pattern recognition genes were able to blur his past as along. The guy who did not, did not. However, there was a third guy sitting in the grass, perhaps the morning before. He too. Uh, saw, thought he saw a tiger in the grass and ran, got back and ran back to the same village, but it was all in his mind. There was no tiger. Uh, he too was able to pass on his pattern <laughs> But he was not cunning, he was paranoid. Um, and so um, both of the evolution has rewarded both of these, uh, these forms of human pattern recognition, bound inextricably uh, with, and with our, our, uh, our sapiens is the bounty and bargain. Uh, for the, of this reward of hallucination and error. And so, that it, it's one thing to um, caution paranoia about Google or consider paranoia about Google, but it's not as if Google's algorithms are not also themselves perhaps deeply paranoid. After all, they see psychedelic dog faces in it. Uh, now, the reason that Deep Dream hallucinates dogs is not itself spooky. So the scientific recognition faculties were trained using the image net data set, which is based on various breeds of dogs. And it will therefore lose to the dogs where there are not and identify people as dogs if it's told to look at them hard enough. Now, the latter may seem insulting, but it shouldn't. Diogenes protocosmopolitan gene is based on the glorious dog like commonality of the soul. And so, if Deep Dream's images are artifacts of the computer's hallucinations and phantom conclusions, then the conspiratorial figure cut by evil, evil Google's stepfather is that same paranoid vision turns inside out and back on itself. Perhaps Google, the AI, is as paranoid in how it sees us as some of us are in how we see it. It's not coincidental or surprising then that as AI matures, its own pattern recognition faculties will reach the plateau of a creative apophenia. From Penton and Arteau to Seymour Cray, many have perceived homologies between having human psychology and various machine behaviors. It is machine vision paranoid? Is our popular understanding of machine vision paranoid? Why does Google watch you? Are they watching you, and if so, who or what are they seeing? Is our understanding of Google's paranoid machine vision itself paranoid, thereby making the paranoid AI that much more paranoid response? Perhaps? Is this how artificial intelligence should evolve in relation to and autonomously from human intelligence? The evolution of human pattern recognition is an indicator based on both productive and destructive apophenia, deception and delusion and creativity, and yes and no. Moving then 
back up to the AI machine sensing as a whole at the level of the city. Um, and in this redistribution of the sensing. The AI city may be, as I say, embodied itself, but not as round. A commingling of diverse sensors, light and air and sound and chemistry, draws a landscape of sensing and thinking little species, partially embodied discreetly with one another, partially co-embodied with one another, as their information inputs are aggregated and modeled and acted upon in various pluralities. Homo sapien comes equipped with an extraordinary array of sensory faculties, which is discussed may be augmented further by synthetic layers, various ratios, ranging from the sensors and trackers in our phones that we carry around like mules, to the more intimate media of artificial images and sounds and so forth. In situating ourselves in this expanded field, however, we are both sensors and sensed. On the one hand, we are we are the primary sapient actor in this drama, supervising an orchestra of sensing technologies, each individually capable of functional processing and together certain forms of intelligence, as neurons are as well. On the other word, not only the subject matter of that scenario, we are, we are not only the subject of that scenario, we are also the subject matter. That wider urban landscape of synthetic sensory systems is not only a platform through which we extend and extrapolate our capacities for abstraction, it is also it is also capable of other sorts of abstraction on its own. As part of its intelligence, it looks at us and registers abstractions about us. And the work of abstraction for urbanism is then not only to deploy abstract forms as architecture, for example, but to set in motion mechanisms and programs that are capable of their own feats of abstraction and to calibrate how they would construct us and one another appropriately. Their program, architectural program, software program, we get to them. And so in short, we should imagine an AI urbanism in terms of Anouk schools stroll into the field populated by intermingling with mutually oblivious little life worlds and or, or in terms of Deleuze's parable of the kick, the latter laying in wait for some threshold event to come its way, at which point it triggers a programmed response, or leaps into the void. Many of our urban sensors in their limited forms of AI work similarly and with similar nobility. More versatile synthetic intelligence occupy a more complex umfelt. Some are predator and prey, some are in motion, some are flowering, some are pollinating. And as we stroll among them, we may be registered by them, or we may be ignored. We may be a primary cause of concern, or we may be a passing interference in an evolutionary dynamic in which we are not protagonists nor part of. And this is, as we might expect, and not so surprising. As many of you are sure well aware, shifts from top-down to bottom-up AI have been marked by a shift of emphasis from intelligence as a form of syntax to intelligence as a form of specifically embodied relation to specific worlds and models. Heuristic knowledge of habitats is seen, is seen as inseparable from AI's manipulation of the situated problem space. Robotics pairing of synthetic sensing, which vision, for example, with algorithmic reasoning, allows for simple artificial species to perform intelligently because they have what amounts to functionally embodied perceptual location in the world. They think because they can see. And again, we may ultimately conclude from this in a way that the, that the registration of the Kantian distinction between perception and cognitive faculties is in some significant ways obsolete. That sensation is a kind of thinking, thinking inextricable from sensing. It, in that it is a, it provides for a, the ability for cartographic abstraction of the environment. And so, so today's AIs, like those protozoa and their gangway, individually more important than aggregate, are not disembodied. They are embodied by machine sensing, machine vision, and network sensors in the city and at the scale of the city. As I wrote in the New York Times piece that uh, David mentioned, it, it is absurd to um, plot AI, as I say, primarily in relation to the of human thought, especially as we quickly recognize 
those models themselves as folk mythologies. And it's equally misguided, I think, to presume that the mammalian sensory platform is the diagram of the sensory apparatus that any AI would embody as the form of the world relating to another and relating, and relating to one another in singular and plural component of all and so forth would be, would be as ours is. They will not and it will not. The cities we build are in this way not only the habitat about which an AI learns expanded embodied contextual knowledge, they are also the distributed sensory apparatuses with which the AI embodies that context. The city layer as a platform and as a governing apparatus is self-incorporating in this way. And so there's less perhaps about AI and cities than cities as AI better AI as a city. Now, the implications of um, AI platforms for our geopolitics are as I think, profound, they extend from the biochemistry of climates and ecosystems to rhetorical conventions of citizenships and sovereignty. These are rather messy AI, not a perfect clean one. And so I want to then conclude these remarks with um, let's say three admonitions. Uh, or it's a general interdisciplinary design group for AI and cities. First, against AI skeuomorphism. Part of the problem with our debates about the role of automation, I think, is based on a sort of infrastructural skeuomorphism. We presume that automation of an economy uh, as it is, um, an automation of the economy would not fundamentally transform uh, that what that economy is. If we just automate what we have, this is an implausible scenario. The killer app of algorithmic governance very well may be insurance, as some have said. But this is because of the, the, its killer rationale is the modeling, mitigation, and enforcement of risk. Risk is what we think the prices signal, but do not. If, if Hayek's identification of the socialist pricing problem is based on plan economies, inability to compute prices in real time, and so to distort price signals, then the capitalist pricing problem is the, is the mystical deference of negative externalities now accumulating in the planet's carbon sinks. In fact, risk, ecological risk in particular, is what we must build into algorithmic governance pricing signals. But to the extent that those are based on the fundamentals of early modern economic theory, it is not. Then more specifically, Algorithmic governance should should be able to enforce rules, but also to learn. So as blockchain advocates, uh, again, we like this decentralized architecture, which is very likely a key means to ensuring its accountability. The transposition of that into a commanding armature may very well mean centralization. And it's getting over the fact that platforms are both centralizing and decentralizing at the same time. And so then quickly a word on platform level. In the city layer. I said stacks are platforms, and not all platforms are stacks. Platforms are both technical and institutional models. Their logics of sovereignty are not reducible to those of states or the markets, but our, our contemporary discussion of the platforms, which increasingly do the heavy lifting of global governance, are discussed as if they were. States have citizens, markets have homo economicus, but the base component political subject of platforms is the loser, a very different creature. Platforms work by decentralized aggregations of interactions made by decentralized distributions of interfaces, one because the other. And as far as the platform is concerned, user sovereignty derives from the decisions that, be, that it would instantiate into the wider interfacial program is available to anything animal, vegetable, mineral, that can interact significantly with those interfaces and so initiate the entire stack. Now, among the structural affordances of stacks is their modularity. What occupies any given layer, including the city layer, can be replaced by new things insofar as they communicate with the layers above and below, according to the protocols of the platform. And for the city layer, we see the address layer, cloud layer, then the whole remains. So not only do stacks accommodate the comprehensive replacement of themselves, their chief design value is that they enable and encourage it. That is, well, this figure of the stack is as of a totality. It is not static. It's made to be remade. 
And so to articulate the stack we have is already to anticipate that someone the stack will come. The risks and potentials of platform sovereignty borne by the geopolitics of platforms is still very much in formation. And it points up, is just as easy on the one hand to cloud feudalism as to what the British call fully automated luxury communism on the other, as well as to the radically open subject position of the user, one available to humans, the network sensors, how to trading out of driverless cars, swarms of animals, and so on. The interface is agnostic as to species. The platforms we're building, including the accidental megastructure of the stack, are predicated on a functional agent subject position that holds far less regard for the special status of human creatures and how it governs with and by sovereign exceptions of exit and entity than we're used to. To be clear, I'm not arguing pro or anti platforms as either a good or an evil. They are, they are a predominant but under theorized technical model. But I am arguing that they are not neutral. They aren't, and that and it is their lack of neutrality that makes them useful as geopolitical design tools. The critique of infrastructure is essential, but it must also rotate into infrastructural scale design if it is serious and not just posture. For this, I think, it's, it, it, I think it is useful to think of them as neutrality, such as this one, but because it provides a framework for considering the distributed agency, subjectivity, causality, and effect at once. There are no externalities because there is no outside. Second, for user suffering. The complexities and contradictions of platform sovereignty in relation to his non human agents, who are nevertheless at least quasi intelligent and sensate actors, were to dismember conventional distinctions between subject and tool, occupant and city, subject and apparatus, the agnostic universal suffrage of the user should be claimed as a stronger materialist and not only legal across the policy territory. We anticipate pushback, however, against that disenchantment, um, against what they, they perceive as a mystified and demonized mathematics. Right? But I see this not only as a distaste for certain forms of financialization, but also pre or a preference for romantic verse. Um, it is also a bulwark on behalf of a free critic and deeply conservative humanist exceptionalism, even humanist fundamentalism. The term user in Europe, the term user has a slightly hippie connotation. In the US, it's more of a utilitarian, cognitive, rational, but the pushing creature. It's always been a kind of fuzzy placeholder for both the image of the human with for which we design and an under theorized idea of how animals and technologies interact. But it's the generic universality of platforms that makes them formally open to all users, human and non human. The user's actions are an interoperable with the protocol for the platform, then in principle it can it can communicate with its systems and its economies. And for this platform to generate user identities whether they're desired or not, anything that can initiate those interactions with the platform can be a user, and, 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 and without the user, without the uh, interacting with it, uh, without the interface knowing and caring what you, who or what you are. The platforms don't care if the state sees you as an illegal immigrant or if the market sees you as an extra. Platforms ultimately don't care if the user, as I say, animal, is animal, natural, or mineral. All users may have platform sovereignty. In security speak, a user is identified is credentialed by uh, one or all of three qualifications. Something you know, like a password, something you are, like a fingerprint, something you have, like a key card. So if someone or something can be, have, and or know, it can be a user. Trading out of driverless car, some paper already made, chemical reaction triggering a threshold event in environment sensor embedded in a leaf in a rainforest, all users. The user is an open position. I think to develop the political and economic design model of the stack to come is thereby inseparable philosophically and technologically from a root conception of the camera as a kind of user and of the user as something that is not necessarily human. It's less user-centered design than the redesign of the user. We'll include the proposal for the PhD for human artificial intelligence interaction design uh, among us. Among us. Next. 
in a set, one can assume pushback as fervent as it is irrational. There are some affinities with technologies, however fictitious or bizarre, that are thought to embody the essence of a creationist food. One of these is food, another of these is, gu is guns, another of these is the car. And I would go, go so far as to predict, based on some conversations with some Google X, that there will be a movement to there will be will be a movement to identify human-driven automobiles as a type of arms in the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution, now used to shield gun owners from obvious liabilities and to protect their sense of personal dominion, will be thrown to keep human beings behind steering wheels. Your life may be ended by someone encased in a two-ton steel box careening down the asphalt vista, trying to prove a point about how technology will never capture his natural. So when this stage is the death of the user, in one sense, the eclipse of a certain resolute humanism, it does so because it brings the multiplication and proliferation of other kinds of non human including excellent human users, along with any combination of which you or I may enter into as part of a composite user. Third and last, Sort of vibrant post anthropocene geoengineering as biochemo informational materials geopolitics. Mm -hmm. The distribution of a mutual uh, co embodiment applied by sensei AI urban scale should, if we are attentive and persistent, shift and expand what we take in ethics of care, of shelter, of encounter, of negotiation, and yes, community. Modern era enemy may pale in contrast to the challenges of predator prey camouflage dissimulation relationships implied by the emergence of multiple alien minds at urban scale. But negotiating our way to a livable post prophecy necessitates, I believe, a fidelity to emergence, not to emergency. Copernican traumas that abolish the false centrality and specialness of human thought and species being priceless accomplishments. The advent of robust inhuman AI will provide for similar disenchantments, one that should enable a more reality-based understanding of ourselves, our situation, and a fuller and more complex understanding of what the challenge is and is not. From there, we can hopefully make our world with greater confidence that our models are good approximations out there, always a helpful thing. Now, arguably, the anthropocene <coughs> itself is due less to technology run amok than to the humanist legacy that understands the world as having been given for our needs and created in our image. We still see this everywhere. Our computing culture is deeply confused and is so along the same lines. We've oscillated between thinking of technology as a transparent extension of our desires on the one hand, and of thinking that it's an unstoppable linear historical force on the other. For the first, the agency is magically ours alone. For the second, the agency is all in the code. The gross inflation is nearly inverted back and forth. And this is why we can't have nice things. A well-known thought leader in the world of design recently wrote, quote, it's time to invent a world in which machines are subservient to the needs and wishes of humanity. Breathtaking. If you think so, I invite you to Google pig decapitating machine. And then let's talk about inventing worlds in which machines are only subservient to human wishes. Actually, don't. But one wonder, wonders whether it's from a society that once gave theological and legislative comfort to chattel slavery that this particular claim could be made in 2015 with such satisfied naivete. This is the sentiment, this philosophy of technology, exactly that is the basic algorithm of the anthropocene, of our predicament. And it's time to move on. This pretentious folklore is too expensive. The word of desire, then, how we map this recombinancy as a theory of subjectivity and the tropes of Eros and Ben and Joseph Trick and Freud, where they have Darwin, let alone genetics and genomics, and so probably read more like one of the Greeks. It's not a sad destiny to be interwoven with alien other diagrams are possible because other diagrams are possible with anatomy and economic. This human body, this earthly landscape of matter are only default settings. They are not destiny. 
chemistry make your life the most radical forms of the political imaginary. Of culinary materialism, rubbing the clinic in the wall. But to do so, it is, I think, harder than it should be. To pick two primitivist Heideggerians and vulgar singularitarians, two groups with which I have which have much more in common than they think, and with whom I have ongoing frustrations, have made it unnecessarily difficult to think and talk about species and technology, certainly as far as, as design theories are concerned. They have made the inevitable, whether we want to or not, geoengineering project that really actually constitutes the eco geopolitics for at least the 21st century, which is something that's either just qualified a priori as a metaphysical atrocity, or something that will simply sort itself out by the invisible hand of Moore's law. The former is Heideggerian mystical primitivism is to me the theological expression of the mode of dwelling that sees the world as here for us. The humanist exceptionalism that is the recipe to the drugs. It is in its fetishization of, hum of the human experience of human experience, the one, and the psychotic proposition that the self is a stable physical entity that can be expanded exponentially without exploding the fact of plurality for the other, that both of these make it far too difficult to see that geoengineering, geodesign project for what it should be. More like molecular gastronomy and landscape sculpture. A restored and resorted ecology designed to taste itself in new forms of richly spiced and imaginative results with mutual ingestion. So one last word, unless I am misunderstood to recommend too much of today's versions of smart cities as models for the urbanism that I'm sketching. I'll end by misquoting a sentence from Adorno's Minimum Moralio, uh, substituting smart cities for his original topic of the city of city. It is not because they turn their back on washed out existence that smart cities are so repugnant, but because they do not do so energetically enough, because they are themselves just as washed out, because the satisfactions they fake coincide with the ignominy of denial. The dreams have no dream. It's an enormously interesting question. I mean, philosophy and biology in the last 10, 15 years, the question is the ontology of life, what actually life is. The RNA alive, the virus is alive, how much heat the movement does it need to be to be the lie? The ego carbon has. I mean, these are, these are really interesting questions, and my initial perspective is to actually go to look fundamental levels so and work back up uh, for that as well. I mean, no one's saying that the question of why we're not alive is, 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 is relevant or that you know, it's the, the, Human, the, the accomplishment of human sapiens is not important. Some of, some of my best friends are human. It's not really a, it's not an anti it's not an anti-human position. It's it's in, I would it in many ways an anti-humanist position in a specific way. In this that we see that the, the humanism is, the, is it, 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 to the extent that certain variations of humanism are predicated on um, this this precedent, this, this making primary human experience of human experience. Apply 
this intelligent sentience and sapience to um, how it is that we make and remake the world in the image of that intelligence. And I think that's really disastrous. I agree. Yeah. Uh, I'm out of my way, but what do you see the future community being? The what? What do you see the future community as being? Um, it's a, it's actually a very good question. I don't know. Um, uh, communities, communities in some way have been. I mean, there's a sense of of commonality. Um, there's a way in which their ethics are based on certainty with empathy. When it's possible to have a kind of empathetic relationship with someone else, the neighborly thing, right? As opposed to the Schmidian friend enemy distinction. In some communities, are, and this is also why some communities are, are deeply, deeply reactionary and conservative, about, all about you know, protecting our, our mores and ways from the people who are on the other side of the river. Um, I'm, I'm really not interested. I, I find this a, a, a kind of right. Uh, 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 Putting so much weight on the um, on, um, localism, the local scale, as a solution to such things, is deeply, deeply dubious. I think part of the question of empathy and also comes down to the capacity. It, it, you know what? In, in, you know, philosophers of the other mind, how it is that you can, how you can imagine an act of communication with things that are not like you. It's easy to be empathetic with someone who is like you and thinks like you. It's much more difficult with someone who simply doesn't think be in the world in the same way. It's a much more um, noble, ethical accomplishment to figure out how to do that. And um, so to the simplest, I think the community is much larger. Right? I think that the localism, the, lo the locality, uh, and um, it is a, is a, it's not a, something we can hang much on in, 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 in this way. Um, but I think it should be more expanded, not only on a spatial scale, but in a, in a in terms, of the, in terms of the possibilities of us encounter. I mean, I honestly think that if, if it were that um, we would should learn a bit more from the coming years of AI the, the, or the diversity of what thinking is um, and be able to situate ourselves within this. Right? Philosophy is always been about thinking about how humans think, but to the extent to which it's typically becoming about other kinds of thinking as well. Um, in cognitive science, in you know, our department of CSD, has been amazing work over the last 10 years, really, with the um, animal cognition um, and the, the incredible sort of interest in diversity that, that goes on there. Um, and I see these as very much, these are very corresponding. Um, how it is that we sort of think about the specificity of human intelligence in relationship to synthetic intelligence in relation to the other kinds of animals that have always been around us. Um, uh, I think those it would allow for that. Right? I mean, um, Agamben talks about the way in which politics is a Italian philosopher, Giorgio Agamben talks about the way in which human politics has always been uh, historically based on the division between uh, humans as a kind of animal and the animals that are not human. It's human animal divide. Like what's inclusive of this is the basis of policy. You know, that divide is, in a way, perforated or um, liquefied in some way, then that community can expand in a certain sense of ways. And so uh, to me, the, um, the, the, the different variations, of the, the two the strains of post-humanism that really emphasize um, um, animality, and the strains of post-humanism that really emphasize um, from the synthetic, uh, synthetic uh, uh, inorganic technologies are actually part of the same story. I, mean, I, think, I think we're saying this. I agree. Okay. Yes, that's true. I, I, don't, I, don't, I find the tour, the tour I find sort of a variously really, um, inspiring and insufferable. It, it, it's very well, he's French. 
<laughs> well, this is actually those ratios are more extreme. Um, no, I mean, you know, the one sentence was like, this is absolutely right. I mean, that sentence, that's absolutely insane. And it sort of goes back to this sort of thing. Parliament, I think, is a terrible, terrible metaphor for what he's trying to describe here, right? The kind of, the, 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 the it's, it's, it's not only an act of democratizing of the policy of the finance, it's, it's absolutely the wrong one. It's all about the legality and, and the discourse and, and laws as a form of burden. It's absolutely wrong. Thing. But you're absolutely right about the communication. Now, the communication can mean obviously several different things. It can mean more literally like how it is that you could actually exchange real Shannon information between forms of life that previously had not been able to do that. What does something that exists at 10 to the negative 4 meters want to say to something that exists at 10 to the 4 meters? What happens when these two kinds of species are fighting? We're actually exchanging actual information with one another. Um, that kind of that you know that 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 kind of synthetic biology is I think really very very interesting. It's, so there's a one of the research programs in our in our center the lead address is one of the things we're looking at is exactly these kinds of issues of how biosymbiosis and, and very very low level um, addressing and information marketing can be can be uh, can be co correlated in this one. Um, but the bigger question of real communication and the sharing of ideas or sharing of, of models then to this as well. Is is um, is exactly the thing. That's true. This is I think is exactly right. This this is a this is a design project. This is a literary project. This is a philosophical project. This is an engineering project. That's I think that's, um, an extraordinary, extraordinarily important long term program. But there's also an issue of power of the hierarchy of you know mm -hmm. who, who needs to understand what. I'm, I think well, a lot need, of needs is a different question. Needs. I mean, there's lots of there's lots of forms of communication that are quite noble that are based on need. So oh, need yeah. isn't the issue. But power, I totally agree. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think some of the, to a certain extent, the, um, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, power is built into the mechanisms and the mediations and platforms themselves. Right? There's a way in which you know if this thing. I think this is part of why I'm talking about platforms in this way, how it construes subjects in this peculiar sort of way. Then I think that, and why I'm underscore the potential for the agnostic, the agnostic logic of this position, um, is because it has the potential for um, not automatic. It has the potential for forms of agential suffrage that other other forms of models that do not. If that, if you, if that's not too convoluted of a sentence. Um, and so it has. I, I, we we want to be attentive to this way, the, those, uh, but also attentive to the ways in which certain kinds of mechanisms that may have been born of certain kinds of power relations that we're, we might find obnoxious may have ultimately have effects if we if we force them in, like, in a certain direction um, to undermine those same powers in a different kind of way, or just open up a different kind of, different kind of field in this way. Um, I think this is generally something that design knows about politics. The politics oftentimes doesn't know about politics. There's a, in, um, uh, the analysis was Stern's second Williams book on the uh, inventing the future. We have a lot this extended discussion of prefigured the politics. It's the idea that in order to have an outcome that you prefer, you want to be decentralized and democratic and dynamic and vibrant and non hierarchical and flat and horizontal. The means and community that would be able to enable visualize that needs to be non hierarchical and flat and horizontal and this as well. And the presumption is that if you can sufficiently police the mechanism, the means, then the ends will simply be extruded from this, from this as well. Um, if you look at sort of the, the canonical urban platform wall, is the urban grid, you know, and which is the most rigid, stupid, inflexible, autocratic topology you could ever superimpose upon an urban space. And yet it's also the best system we've come up with for producing vibrant, non-hierarchical, decentralized, individually autonomous movement through that space. And so it's the it, it's not only the non have the non necessary relationship between the the the, pulp, the means and ends, but in fact the way in which they may be totally inverted to one another. This as well. This is something I think that um, those who would be sympathetic to this larger scale question of this composition, this com communicative composition between these other forms, is one that um, wants to prioritize questions of power should be attentive to this. Level. The means and effects are not always correspond, nor should they ever. Yeah. I, I thought your staging of this like plurality of intelligence was just really amazing and I, I think it's really important. I just want to touch on this question of the political again, just 
I just want to make sure I understand exactly your, your position there. But at one point you said something about the automation of the friend enemy decision. Yeah. Um, which, now that you mentioned Schmidt, it seems like that would be more analogous to the depoliticization of the world rather than its politicization. I, I asked that, maybe I'm wrong, but, but one of the things I'm thinking of taking out from my friend is saying, even if we agree in your critique of open anti-Cubanism and the human you know, Schmidt's anthropology could be likened to something like the human as really unpredictable because of its lack of any you know, peculiar uh, identity or, or content or, or privilege. It's unpredictable and dangerous in a way that programs and machines would be harmed. That's something that we might draw also from, let's say, Simon Dog, the idea that the human is the dangerous of one or another. Different from the animal, not in terms of its content, but it's not the inside. But it's not it's not just it's not unique in this regard. No, I it's, I, I, it's, I, I, I guess that's just, the direction you're going, but so I, that, that my question is really just it's out of curiosity. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where where would you see the political benefit for if we're opening up the machine world to the kind of unpredictability and, and openness, let's say, that the human takes in that narrative, um, yeah. including Schmidt's anthropology, I would say. But, but where is the, the, the boundary of community when it's about violence and killing? That, that, that's just well, that's, that would be the, that's the Schmidtian remark. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, in the staff book, there's a bit just to sort of contextualize that, that reference to the automation of this distinction. The, the first section of the book is an extended discussion of Schmidt's notion of nomos uh, and this geographical distinction of inside and outside, right? And the way in which this fundamental distinction, which is a sort of line in the ground, is both the mechanism that truly subdivides the Earth in a particular way, and also the model from which a political armature of the global politics would emerge in the image of this as well. We have the question of what is what would be the nomos of the class? Is it both land and sea and air at the same time? Uh, in which its jurisdictional logic is one in which you can have multiple total planes over the same site and the same person at the same time. It's not based on this. I mean, the West Farley model that Schmidt was referring to is a horizontal, planar picture of the world with a land, not of air, not of sea, subdividing into a loop topology. Everything inside every one of these loops is the sovereign of a, a flag and a king and a currency and a World Cup team, and, you know, each of them postage thing. Um, today, the condition of points one which we have to have models of these super, superimpositions of power. So part of the argument that I make, particularly in the city letter chapter of, of that book, is about how that, and of course for, for Schmidt, it's the, it's the, there's just a question of, for the nomos, is this distinction inside and out. Now part of the argument that I make is that not only is it the sovereign decision of the inside and out based upon where the line goes and when it gets drawn, but that what's the inside and what's the outside is the secondary distinction that always has, that has to be made, which, that Schmidt essentially Sort of and there's a, the story that I tell about the um, this uh, picture from the Boston, the Yugoslavian city in the early 90s, where for the most part this war was ignored, it was sort of, you know, the sort of the, the hangover of 1989, which is moving on already, and just, just some sort of like Eastern European, like they didn't get the message yet, but it all sorted stuff out. It turned out it was actually the future. Everything. Um, it was just, you know, people with unpronounceable names doing unspeakable things. And this picture came out in, in, uh, in British newspapers of Bosnian Bosnian prisoners in a Serbian camp and went around the world just instantaneously in every newspaper. There's a camp, concentration camps in Central Europe again. And this really was this effect as an event to mobilize world in Serbia. The Serbian response is very interesting. They said, no, 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 you have it all wrong. It's not that those prisoners are inside the camp and the photographer came and was taking pictures of them. The photographer was inside the camp and the prisoners were coming from the outside looking in on him, curiously wondering what he was doing. And so for Novo, a gauntlet, of course, which camp is the nomos of the modern. It's just the capacity to make this space that, that, that makes the instantiates architectural this, this exception. There's a secondary exception that, 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 that needs to also be added, and that is the reversibility of that work. So it's not just the camp is the nomos of the modern, the enclave, which is that inverted camp that holds the world at bay, is equally the nomos of the modern. It's this inside-out camp enclave dynamic. Uh, 
um, that is really where that exception works at the level of, of this architecture. architecture. So what I discussed in the book a little bit is about how it is that that decision to let it in or out, do you get in, do you get out, right? the Deleuzean society controls the image of the city as a matrix of interfaces. Can we see there's an automation of this particular sovereign decision of deciding at one point or another, do, are you on the outside or are you on the inside? Is this the inside, is this the outside? And what is one for you, what, what can the inside be one for the outside for the other? And so our paths are made. You can see that, and that's essentially the way in which this power is built into the mechanism itself. It's not just it's oriented to software or program or it's a course of these things. But it's not as though there's a, a, you know, a, a guy with a hat giving a decree every time this stuff happens. It's something that's happening millions of times a second all over the place. And you walk through these gateways as we get to the city, what the city is. Now you could say this ubiqu making ubiquitous of that sovereign decision at the level of the interface that's deciding camp versus enclave, enclave versus clan, is a, is a making politics a totally pervasive. Or you could say it's a dissolution of politics, a dilution of politics into where politics has no significance anymore because it's essentially it's, its capacity is a separate domain, as a domain that's delimited from um, the economy, delimited from all these sorts of things, is basically gone. <coughs> Um, but it also implies to a certain extent that there's a kind of infrastructural homology or isomorphic relation between these things that as any user of an interface is see you as a user to decide whether you get in or out as well. That decision may be more important than whether or not you're a citizen or whether or not you're a, or whether or not you're an adult or a child or any of the other kinds of things that the that would separate you from the policy and that keep you out of the policy right? Are you a you know, are you a resident or a refugee? And so it's, it's those kinds of ways in which the, the, the user position actually enables a bigger space in the room um, than the political, than the traditional model of political subject appropriate queens, that are the kinds of things we want to be most attentive to and most um, maybe try to um, guard it.